here. I'm going to try to entertain you in the next 20 minutes or so um, with the two very uh, common molecules, which some of you know. Um, I didn't know them that well before I went to Germany, and I'm going to share some personal experience on that. The two molecules are flacanate and presogrel, and obviously this is at the same point the conflict of interest from the company who, who delivers these molecules on the creation market. So let's say a couple of firm flacanate. Uh, now, you know that the number of antiarrhythmics is huge throughout history. However, at the end of the day, for most of the arrhythmia, very few remain. And this is typically because of the side effects. Because if you give some of those drugs to actually sick patients, you kill them more than you help them. So at the end of the day, at least for atrial fibrillation, the alphabet is very short. And if you even, you can sh even shorter it further because some of those drugs are not, uh, and other not available or not used in our countries anymore. So at the end of the day, you have what I always say, tell to the patients, three and a half antiarrhythmic drugs for atrial fibrillation, the half being dronenodron. Uh, and I'm going to uh, share a thought on that with you in just in a second. Now, this is me in 2014, moving from Croatia to Germany. And as you all know, I don't know if that has changed now, but in Croatia, uh, during my time there, there was um, uh, propafenon only uh, for, for 1C category of, um, uh, 1A category of antiarrhythmics drugs. So we had actually virtually no experience with fecainet. And um, it was always sad a little bit at our meeting that this is a very dangerous drug and that is, a, I know a colleague who always said it's a good thing that we don't have flak in it because it's dangerous, you have to initiate it in hospital, it causes proarrhythmia, everything is bad. Now then I came to Germany, things changed, not always for the better, warning to the young people, don't think that everything is better than, on the contrary. However, they virtually don't use Rhythmonorm. They use just proper, uh, they use just typically flacanin, and they use it very simply. They just uh, give it to the patient, then you make one ACG within 24 to 48 hours, look at the QT uh, uh, interval and fire and forget, and you give it, you give it, uh, you give it on. And it works uh, quite quite good and similar to profefenon. So what do we find on this drug in the guidelines for treating AFib, the new ones two years ago, 2020? You'll find two uh, topics of indication or two areas of indication. The one is an acute situation for cardioversion, where it has a 1A class and level of evidence indication uh, alongside with profefenon. So you can give that and you can also use it for the so-called facilitated cardioversion if the first one doesn't work and you want to smear a little bit or something on the atrial muscle and then try with the with the car the, with the electrical current again um, what about the long-term use again alongside with propafenone very high level of recommendation however this is not always and this is one point of criticism to these guidelines because they just keep on transcripting this drug for 12 years. I mean, we liked this drug 10 or 12 years ago. However, the problem with the Dronedoron is that this 1A indication is based on one single randomized study that even didn't even look at the sinus wave, but on the um, subjective feeling of the P of the patients, being the Athena study at that time. So, but they just keep moving on with 1A, although there are no many more randomized trials. So level of evidence A is actually unclear to me, at least there. And the thing is that uh, if you look at a more contemporary electrophysiological antiarrhythmic practice, and this is a, certainly the case in my practice, there is no multac on the in the field, so you don't use that actually in the patients. And this is also shown data from modern data, one trial investigating drugs versus PVI in paroxysmal atrial and persistent atrial fibrillation, the Cabana trial. My, some of you uh, may have may be familiar with that, and you see that in real world practice actually is not there. And the other thing that we have to bear in mind, it is nothing less or more than a very expensive beta blocker, 10 times being 10 to 15 times more expensive than the normal beta blockers. It's simply, it's not a problem, it's not a dangerous drug, it doesn't work. So, at the end of the day, what you have and what I would um, give you on the way uh, as concluding the remarks on Flacanid in 2020 AC, uh, AFib guidelines is that you may use it in long term as well as profefenone in long term rhythm control with a high level of recommendation, provided of course that the 
part of those patients are not too sick, there is no major structural disease, there is no significant LV hypertrophy, and they don't have uh, really significant coronary artery disease. And you might consider giving those patients concomitant beta blockation, which will most of the part-time do anyway, because if those patients do get atrial fibrillation, then it's less fast and patients are typically less symptomatic, so most of those patients, uh, apart from those two who are really slow with the pulse, do get beta blocker anyway. So, changing to the perhaps a little bit more interesting topic, there was some talk on this uh, earlier this morning as far as I know, um, pressor grill. So, I have two points I would like to discuss uh, when talking to, about pressor grill. The first point is uh, distinction between pressor grill and ticagrel. Which one is better, which one is not better, when to use which one. And the other issue, uh, which actually pertains to both of those molecules, molecules is the issue of pretreatment. Do we load these patients as soon as possible, as soon as if somebody gets a uh, ACS here on the floor, what do we do? Do we let them swallow uh, the drug immediately or do we wait until they get to the cath lab uh, or even until the coronary anatomy is known? So let's look at those two things briefly. The background of the question between Presogrel and Ticagrel is as follows. First of all, there is no question, absolutely no question in the cardiologic and especially in the interventionalist cardiologic community that the dual antiplatelet treatment typically consisting of aspirin and another uh, platelet, antiplatelet drug is a mainstay of treatment after we place a stent in a patient and even after, even if we don't. Then we also know that there are some, at some point, hyped and even more theoretical, some realistic drawbacks of clopidogrel treatment. Let me be just clear, clopidogrel is still the dominant platelet hammer as well in the States as in Germany. And it's a good drug. It's far better than what we used to have before. But there are issues, of course, from pharmaco kinetic perspective of action onset, which is much slower, and you want to get those people treated as soon as possible. There might be issues with its potency and also with the consistency of its antiplatelet activity. So on those, on the, based on those background, the new uh, third generation P2Y12 inhibitors came into play. And the championships won for those two molecules were the typical big randomized phase three trials for ticagrelor plato and for presigal the trip triton timid 38 study however after that and this is always a little bit of marketing issue we know the story from noax we all try to compare the noax for 10 or 12 years and we use the phase three trials this is possible and legal to a certain degree because there are huge differences in patients' populations, in design of this study. So you, we, can, we can safely state that the comparison, which one is better on which one is preferred for which patient, is rather unclear based on these data. And the companies, of course, again, we know that from NOAC world, are very, very unkeen and very reluctant to perform head-to-head -head comparison because of the costs and, of course, of the risk of losing. It's a gamble. It's good drugs. So you, don't, you never know what's, what's going to come up. So enter the study ESA REACT-5. Most of you might be familiar with that. This was a huge deal in, in 2019, published in New England uh, Journal of Medicine, as good as it gets. It was a very interesting study, at least that uh, really uh, stirred up the cardiological and interventionalist community in Germany, at least at that point. Not at least because it was a German study. It was a study conducted mostly in German centers and two Italian centers. However, it was a very, very realistic study. And it took out to actually with a the hypothesis of the study is to test the two contendents against each other, but the hypothesis behind it was, it that, was that the ticragrelor would be better. The, the result was surprising. So what, what they did, they took some, somewhat over 4,000 patients with ACS, and here comes the one point which makes it 
rather positive for me, the study, because it is very likely to be similar to what we do in everyday clinical practice. What we see, so these were all patients with ACS. So we deal with the non-STEMIs, the STEMIs, the unstable anginas, and all of them, and this is, I think, typical for the world where we live, at, at least, uh, Western Europe, and of course, meanwhile, definitely also Croatia, is that all those, all those, most of those patients undergo cath procedure. So there is a planned interventional strategy uh, there. And what they actually did, they did not compare drug with drug. They actually, per design, compared two different strategies. So you actually, in that study, you get an answer, not only or a hint, which molecule might be a bit better, but you also get a hint about when to give it. What about preloading? What's the timing of the of the dual antiplatelet treatment? Because in the Pressel strategy, it was typical to wait until the coronary anatomy was known, or the patient has actually entered the cath lab. So the meantime until the drug was given after randomization was 10 times longer than the Kagerol study strategy where the drug was given as soon as possible after the randomization, which roughly also corresponds with what we do know based on the, on the previous studies and on the clinical practice. And then they looked at the typical primary endpoint, which is fine as all those studies, and this is the combination of cardiovascular death myocardial infarction and stroke at a, a time point of one year. And what they found was a bit surprised because Presidler fared so highly statistically better, the Presidler strategy, not the, only the molecule, but the strategy fared better than the Ticagrelor strategy, and this was, as I said, um, um, highly statistically significant, and this is shown, this primary endpoint in the, from the original publication in New England Journal of Medicine, these two curves diverging relatively, uh, relatively early on and continuing up to the uh, follow-up time point of uh, 12 months. Also looking at some of the sec secondary uh, and the points which were also exhibit, uh, examined in this trial is that at one year there were no significant differences but a tendency for lower cardiovascular death incidence. The myocardial advantage was also not significantly different but a bit lower in the Pressigrel group. There was half of, but these are low numbers, so no statistical uh, significance, because the stent thrombosis nowadays, as we all know, who perform stent procedures, luckily is a very, very rare event. And even if it happens, you don't know if it happened because of the drug or of your malapposition to too uh, small uh, uh, or d d with the section ended stenting procedure. So uh, it was also, uh, in terms of that, uh, a little bit of difference there, but not statistically significant. And what was not observed is that uh, there was more bleeding in one group or the other, which is also an interesting observation, because at least my subjective idea prior to this was always that I get somewhat the same thing in terms of prevention of ischemic events with, ty with ticagrelor, and I don't pay for more, with more bleeding. This was something that was on as a message out there before this. And however, this bleeding endpoint, very important safety endpoint, was not different. The tendency was actually uh, uh, in favor of Presidel. So the comment that some of the comments, some of the comments that were made after that was that if, of course it was an open label study and only two countries participated. But I think those two countries are quite representative from what to, for what we in this room do in our everyday practice. There is a somewhat discon greater discontinuation rate with tacagrelor, which might, might lead to uh, uh, a little bit worse results for that drug. But on the other say, side, that also uh, speaks a little bit for the better side effect profile of prasugrel, which is also, I think, clinically relevant. And as I s tried to emphasize, the study did not test just drugs, but the two uh, the two strategies, strategies, and those two strategies are a little, were a little bit uh, different, as I as I said earlier. I think that one of the uh, one of the facts or one of the points when you look at the study design that underscores uh, the the comment that it is a little bit more realistic for our uh, uh, actual practice, our uh, practice in the real world nowadays, is that uh, as compared to the older phase three studies of the broad drugs, the usage of drug eluding stents was actually virtually 100%, which was 10 or 12 or 15 years ago, as those patients were recruited, definitely not the case. Uh, 
And those findings were confirmed by a couple of other, and this is just a selection of a couple of other um, registry data, one coming from actually two publications coming from Scandinavian, uh, um, uh, from Sweden, and the one is in the realm of non-STEMI and the other is the realm of non-STEMI, but this with very similar messages. The one message from SCAR registry in non-STEMI patients was that there is no, and this goes to the pre-treatment strategy, there was no uh, big difference between, between routine pre-treatment and no pre-treatment. However, there was some difference because the routine pre-treatment did uh, lead, statistically significant, to a higher uh, event rate of in-hospital bleeding. And when they looked from the similar patient group from the SCAR registry, Sweden uh, registry, uh, at the same patients, you may observe that in terms of the primary endpoint, which was death, cardiovascular death, or secondary endpoints such as stent thrombosis and infarct latent patency. And again, here you see, due to the very low numbers, the confidence intervals here are rather low. Uh, there were no actually differences and no advantages to be found in the pretreatment course. So preloading, no improvement of clinical outcome, outcome, but at least in non stemi patients, in this uh, data set at least, increased uh, possibility of significant bleeding. And another piece of evidence which comes from this trial, this was a randomized trial actually, with 1, and more than 1,040 patients in non stemi patients, again, uh, subjected to invasive strategies, so underwent coronary angiography and most of them stenting. And they, here they examined actually the issue of ticagrel preloading versus no preloading, whereas the patients in no preloading group actually afterwards could get either Tyka or Prasu. And uh, uh, the endpoint was the so-called net clinical benefits of balancing the ischemic risk as against the safety risk of bleeding. And again, there is no advantage of preloading. And the studies was actually this study was actually prematurely terminated because no uh, no benefit could have could be. Uh, uh, could have been observed. So the vaccine question that actually was out there during the past decade or so, should we pre-treat or not pre-treat the patients with acute coronary syndrome with those drugs? Uh, whereas on the one hand, what might be intuitive and what might bring to the, us to the hypothesis that this is a good thing to do is the more rapid onset and more early onset of rapid of, of platelet inhibit inhibition if we pretreat. On the other hand, we have to bear in mind when that in real clinical practice, around one third of patients who are pre coming to hospital and undergo invasive strategy under the presumption of uh, non-STS uh, elevation ACS are actually disproved in the diagnosis, uh, so you give them something for something that they don't have. And there is indeed no significant effect of death, reinfarction, or stent thrombosis, and there might, at least in non STEMI uh, cohort, be an increased risk of bleeding. So the, the, uh, I find this, uh, this editorial that was accompanied, that accompanied the dubious uh, publication uh, pertaining to the question to treat or not to pretreat uh, that the non-ST elevation, at least in non-ST uh, uh, segment elevation, acute coronary syndrome, this study may have been uh, the last nail in the coffin of pretreatment because there is no benefit for those patients. There might be harm because there is more bleeding. There is no ischemic risk actually out there in waiting without pretreatment under the condition that it is not too long, for example, if you wait more than uh, several hours, that might be different. Uh, it's confirmed in real life data, and actually at the end of the day, the new guidelines have changed this paradigm. paradigm. So do what do we have, and i like to conclude with that, pre pre on pretreatment for ACS, and especially for non-ST elevation ACS. Uh, if you look at the American publication from 2021, they say that in contemporary times, most patients with ACS undergoing early angiography, a strategy of loading with a P2Y12 inhibitor after the anatomy is after the anatomy is known appears to be to offer appears to offer similar benefits. So there is no advantage to preloading. First point. Second point, the ESC 2020 guidelines for non-ST uh, elevation ACS do explicitly not recommend the pretreatment. And this is shown also in this in this red class three recommendation. So what do we do now? And this is what I can offer as my 
experience for Germany at least at this point is that in 2014, it's interesting, interesting, when I came there, the, the German doctors in our hospital, but as well, elsewhere as well, had a very, very peculiar recommendation for how to choose between effiant and, and, and brillic. And the recommendation was actually that you give effiant in stamy for some unknown reason. There's no data for that. But this was just, you know, the piece boats out of the market, I think. And this is what, how we did. And to give a brillic for non-STS. This was the situation in 2014. And we didn't think about that a lot. We just did it like this. Nowadays, and especially, I have to say, after the publication of ESA React 5, the things have changed. So we actually do get, do more of our patients, almost all of our patients, only if they are con typical contraindications, do get Prasugrel in um, ACE acute coronary syndrome, with the exemption being those people who really uh, might not profit, as is also stated by the, by the uh, labeling of the drug, the very old, the people who have low weight or who have had a recent neurological event, those people still get ticagrelor. And we definitely, and this was never the case during the eight years I was there, there is no preloading in German uh, emergency cars and in emergency, emergency rooms. Everybody gets to the cath lab uh, quite quickly and then it is uh, decided to give the patient the dual antiplatelet rhythm. And with that, I would like to conclude and I'm hope open and happy for your questions. Thank you very much.